No. But you remind me I forgot something, so I'll, I'll take care of it as soon as we get going. <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome to the second lecture. Um, Haley has reminded me that I forgot to ask for volunteers for next week. And so what we need, we're at, we're at a number where we can take about three people every week and um, share and get together and just, and I will be sending out, you've seen the group email so you can get to one another. Um, get together and figure out what it is you're going to do. And it doesn't mean you have to do it in concert, but you want to just figure out so that it's it's going together. So three volunteers for next week. Anybody? Haley. Who else? Okay, and uh, Ian, is that right? Yeah. And at the back? Jackie. Jackie, thanks. Okay, and so when you come in next week, put the food in the other room and then we'll go. And if you, as I said, I think in one of the initial emails, if you're bringing a soup or something, then you'll want to email the whole class so we know to have bowls and spoons and that sort of thing. And soups don't necessarily go right now unless it's some of the tomato cucumber soups I know, which are so good at this time of the year. But later in the year, as it gets chillier, we will work those out. Thank you, Haley. That would have been disastrous. <laughs> Okay, let's go on. Let, let's talk about um, uh, permaculture and um, where we're going with it. Um, and the question is, why is this important now? Um, and clearly, and this is to the positive side, clearly we've reached a place where sustainability is no longer a word that pops up on your spell check and says, no, it's underlined in red. Now it's there, right? And that took forever. I tell you what, I was writing to those people 15 years ago. Can't you spell sustainability? Um, so it's a known entity. Um, you're sitting in this room for a reason. You're concerned about where we're going as a species relative to our ability to maintain ourselves on this planet. And so, and you're not alone. It's happening everywhere. You know this. You know what's going on. Um, we hear bad news a lot about things going wrong with the environment. Um, and it's real easy, and, and sometimes I fall into the trap of, of letting that dominate my thought. Like, oh gosh, what are we going to do about the Caribbean now with all that uh, dispersing? You know, well, I would rather talk about the good news. I would rather figure out how to do things right. And so, as much as I can, I'm going to stay positive and I'm going to look forward proactively to doing the right thing. And I, I encourage you to do that with me. Um, we're here because we know that there are limits. Um, I think, and, and Toby Hemingway came to town last year. Did anyone see him when he was here? Yeah. And uh, basically what he said, and I really liked how he was going about this. He said, you know, there are a lot of people who have a doomsday scenario going. And it's hard not to imagine that being true, but I like the way Toby approached it because he said, no, we don't have to do that. Now, we're at how many people on this globe now? It's closing in on seven billion. Yeah. Um, I believe. Look that up. Google that, okay? You're going to Google it right now, aren't you? <laughs> we'll have that answer very soon. Um, the carrying capacity of the Earth is about 2 billion. And so it's just like when I say to you, if you're going to live like me, it's going to take 4.3 Earths to handle all the humans. Well, where do we get those other 3.3 Earths if you live like me? Mars? Honor <laughs> Really? <laughs> um, 
we've got some issues there. So, but, but the point I was making is Toby was very positive about how we get down to that two billion. And, and it, it, as we, and we'll see this later in the semester, as our education rises, and as our ability to understand rises, in fact, the birth rate decreases. And in fact, across Europe and even in this country, uh, the birth rate has declined significantly. In Germany, it's below two. And so what that means is that it's on the decline because obviously the way you make babies takes two people. So if it's less than two, we're going downhill. Well, okay, but that's just one place in one culture. And, and there are other cultures that are going the other direction. Well, the point is, <laughs> this was a story that had a profound impact on me. And this happened, oh gosh, 25 years ago. You know, when you have um, a total eclipse of the moon, and if there's a full moon and you have a total eclipse of the moon, has anyone seen that? <coughs> it's amazing. Um, I, and it happened when I was first teaching here at NC State. And I went out, they had an astronomy field where they taught astronomy. And they had little pedestals they put, you know, these telescopes on. So I drove out there and um, I, I stood there with this group of people and I looked up and when it happened, okay, the moon is now kind of this dull red. And it's not shiny bright. It's dull red, and the stars are disappearing behind it and coming out the other side. And I stood there, and I felt, I said, my goodness. And I almost had vertigo because I said, I'm standing on the outside of this big ball rushing through space, and why am I not falling off? It's possible for me to fall off. And basically, I understood for the first time in my gut what what I was doing. I was living on this huge mass of rock and water and all that stuff rushing through space. And it was finite. There was an edge to it. And it, it came in in a visceral way. And, and understanding that it's finite, that's what they said, you recall that, when the astronauts, when they said, you're going to go up in space, we're going to go up in space and we're going to look back and take a photo, then we'll understand and we'll know that this Earth is magic. And that's what happened when they did that. The astronauts became, what's the guy who went up, Buzz Aldrin, and he opened the center, and this is one you might want to look into, the Center for Mnemonic Research out in California. He became a mystic. Because it is that special when you look back at this globe we're all traveling on. You know, we walk around every day and we take it for granted. It's a really magical place relative to our species and many, many others. The fact that it keeps us alive. But it's finite, and that's the point. I can't live the way I live because there are not 3.3 other Earths available for us to just go to. We're on this one. And so we have to figure out how to fit ourselves more reasonably onto this one. That's why it's important. Okay. So let's look at some things here. This is from the book um, Regenerative Design for Sustainable Development by John Lyle. This came out of um, Cal Poly Pomona. John Lyle was a landscape architect that taught there in their program. And he was essentially a contemporary of Mollison at the time. They were both doing essentially the same thing at the same time. You've heard that, that there are synergistic ideas that are kind of evolving and coming on in different parts of the globe, just you know, serendipitously, so to speak, but maybe there's more connection. Well, John Lyle wrote that book, um, Regenerative Design, and I recommend it. It's one of the ones on that list I have for you. Uh, really nice book. Um, what he's saying with this image, where do I draw? I draw here. Um, this stuff is the natural world. This is where people live. And this stuff here, the dotted area, is what it takes 
to support the people that live there. So at a time when our population was less, we could function really easily. When the first Europeans landed on this nation, um, and, and there's disagreement, and again, this can be Googled fairly easily. I've heard anywhere from 600,000 people lived on this continent, anywhere up to 18 million people lived on this continent. Well, somewhere in between. How many people live on this continent now? 300 million. 300 million, exactly. 300 million. And so how do they fit? Um, I like to tell the story... The population of Japan, which is somewhere around 125 million, essentially, if you take away the land of the Japanese islands that are not inhabitable, essentially that land is the same size as the coastal plain of North Carolina, from Raleigh to the beach. So you've got 125 million people living in the coastal plain of North Carolina. Well, that's tight. No wonder they're into miniaturization and bonsai. I mean, what? I would be too. No wonder they're into meditation. You know, how are you going to get away? You can't make room small enough. Go inside your mind. Um, the issue is, um, this worked at a time when our population was less. But um, as we went, oops, what's happening how do I make that stuff go, Arthur? I'll close that X at the corner. Gotcha. Ah, there we go. Great. The system that we've developed is a linear system. And that is, we take stuff from someplace. That's, that's the resource base. Um, wherever that is, whether we're taking <laughs> minerals out of the earth or cutting down trees or whatever we're doing. And, and we run it through some sort of a throughput. We change it. We take the bauxite out of the earth. We heat it up to outrageous degrees. We stamp it, we paint it, and we've got a beer can. Okay? So we have trans, transformed a mineral into a thing. And then what we do, if we're not conscious is we put it in a sink, you know, wherever that may be. If you recycle beer cans, for the same energy it takes to make one beer can, you can make 85, okay? So it makes sense to recycle in that case. We're not, we're not dumping it in a sink and, and getting rid of it. And so what happens is, what happened initially was we started to run out of sources. Well, we're running out of sources right now. We know that. But then, and, and a woman, Danella Meadows, she wrote the book Beyond the Limits. And this was written in 9091, where she was saying we're already beyond the limits. What she was saying is we're running out of sinks. Where do you put, what's the air quality? Uh, both, well, several people come from Charlotte. You know this. There's, it's bad. The, the federal government is going to stop giving money to Charlotte unless they get their traffic patterns figured out. And Raleigh is right behind them. You know, the air quality is not good. So, and, and the water, you know, what do we do with the water? Um, Jacques Cousteau studied how the oceans were going and how they were taking that stuff out and into the oceans and just dumping it. And when you watch, you know, Mollison's In Grave Danger of Falling Food, you'll see that. Um, there's a person now, I read about this about a month ago, who is starting a movement to go out into the oceans and go down and take that junk out of the oceans because the oceans are such a precious resource that we can't continue to leave that awful stuff down there. Um, and the land, obviously, there are always fights when you're putting in another landfill, always. And in fact, there are people who are doing some very creative things right now with landfills. They're figuring out, if you're going to take this and you're going to put it to the landfill, let's figure out where in the landfill we're going to put it, because eventually we're going to want to go back and mine it 
because we're going to reuse it. So they're structuring landfills so that there's known materials in known spots. They're making maps for landfills because that's stuff we may need. And, and that time is coming. So it's, it was a linear system that really doesn't work. Uh, I don't like this. Um, come on. What am I doing wrong now, Arthur? I got to put the red no, I don't think so. Try it now. Try it now. Got it. Okay, here we go. Um, and this is what has happened. We've we've got to set up given where we are and what's happened with our population, where the um, the area that people take to live and the area that people take to support where people live are basically overwhelming the natural system. Um, the example I give. Um, and, and this is the one I read. In the British Isles, you have London, which is about an 8 million size population, me metropolitan area. It takes the whole rest of the British Isles to support that. But meanwhile, you've got population throughout the rest of the British Isles. So essentially what's happening is the land that it takes to support a population has expanded. So when we think about what we're doing, and we're saying, okay, we're living in a city, and actually cities are now proving to be some of the most su sustainable places in the world to live, because you take up less land, the problem is you take up land out there. Okay, if you're in the city, you're a walkable city, you've got all that stuff going for you. But out there is where the action is. So it's what, it, what, what my take on it is, is, for instance, if we just take one item, food, we can, and my goal is to grow 50% of the food that uh, me and my family needs on the land I live on. And I've, I've just recently upped it from a um, uh, uh, fifth of an acre to a third of an acre. I think, and, and we're at about 20% now, I think I can do, I don't know, 35, 40, but I'm going to keep my goal at 50. So if I take and I grow that much food in my own piece of land, then that land out there that is now supplying the food can go back to nature or whatever. So what I'm saying is, is we need to look at this differently. Let's see. Um, and this is by Lewis in, in the, um, in the uh, New Yorker magazine. But um, So uh, some of the issues going on, and, and these slides were given to me by David Holmgren. Some of you have seen these before. And I've showed these on TV before, but basically we're in a situation where we have this going on, environmental and social crisis. We've got, um, uh, on the environmental end, climate change. We know climate change is real. There's a lot of, there's a lot of noise out there saying it's not real. Um, we lived through this summer, for those of you who are in Raleigh. We know it's different. Um, it's changing, and the evidence is overwhelming. <coughs> in support of the fact that we are going through climate change. Land degradation, we know that. It keeps going down. Resource depletion, we'll talk about uh, uh, peak oil in a minute. On the social side, family and community breakdown, um, uh, it's just changing radically from, from what it was. Uh, addictive behaviors, we're all rather addictive. Okay, I want to watch ESPN in the morning. Um, I want to have that, um, that, that uh, bread when I, you know, what, what, we all have addictive behaviors, and, they, and they're there for a reason. On the economic and political end, national and household debt, unprecedented. Unprecedented. Uh, thankfully, we're starting to go in the other direction relative to people saving. We've been saving more now than we have in 10 or 15 years because we're all worried that it's going to be real scary in the near future. Um, there's robber baron capitalism. You know, what happened with the hedge funds and all that stuff that, that deep-sixed the economy two years ago? Um, and that was just greed. So all of these things are coming at us. We know this. So what can we look forward to in the future? Um, and again, these are put together by David Holmgren. Agriculture was invented, and by the way, I believe very strongly agriculture was invented by a woman because women were the hunters and gatherers. 
They're the ones that looked around and said, huh, that garbage heap I was at last year now grows the squash that I want this year. Isn't that amazing? How did that happen? And they discovered seeds. You know, so all of a sudden we have agriculture coming. And that wasn't the hunters running down the elk with clubs. No, no. They were running around getting bloody. No, <laughs> women did it. But it started, uh, and, you know, that's not necessarily positive, by the way, because the way agriculture goes now is really a problem. So we'll talk about that, too. If we look at it relative to the energy and resource use, population pollution, we're looking at a graph, X, Y. And, and we take it, um, and I'm sorry somehow this changed color on me. Um, it says pre-industrial sustainable cultures um, at the lower end. And as it goes up on the, on the y-axis as we get forward in time, certainly what's happening is we get into the industrial ascent or modernism. And then at the climax, which is essentially where we are now, what we're looking at is how do we get out of here? And so one way is the techno fantasy. And we heard a lot about this during the last administration and a lot before that. Um, and, and, and it's a pipe dream. Oh, don't worry. We'll invent our way out. Right. Um, I read the book, and, and I recommend this. It's, a, it's a, a funny little book. Well, not funny at all, but it, it's if ironic. It's called Enough is Enough, you know, and it's, and it's talking about nanotechnology and where that's going and, and what is possible when that gets going and, and, uh, and, and out of hand. Well, okay, here's a techno fantasy, and I can laugh at these people. Okay. These people laugh at me because this is one I buy into. Oh, if only I shut the water off when I'm brushing my teeth, everything will be okay. No, no, that's not enough. We can't be a little bit better, a little bit greener. It's not going to work. Um, this is really kind of where it's going, and, that's, and, and, and as, we, as we get into a lower energy paradigm and that's the issue here and that's something remember or write it down we're heading into a lower energy paradigm we're at peak oil or we're beyond it and just last week on on NPR they had a piece on this they said the oil we're taking out now is much harder to get and they were talking, they said, we've got better technologies to go into the shale and extract it, but it's much harder to get. Harder equals what? More expensive. more expensive. Right. And if we have more expensive oil, as Howard Kunstler says, we're not going to be able to afford the 3,000 miles Caesar salad. We can't. It won't be there. And so why not have a backyard Caesar salad? That's what I have. I grow the greens that I use, my wife and I, and she's, she's the master gardener in my home, um, and she loves growing greens. We have greens from the end of September through the middle of June daily from our garden. You can grow it all winter long here. So I don't have a 3,000-mile Caesar salad, and it's possible. We can take that on. We can do that. So essentially, if we're not careful, we'll have the Atlantean scenario. But really, I think what's going to happen, the create, created descent, and this is uh, called permaculture. Um, and that's really what we're advocating here. What we're going to look at is we're going to look at how do we live, and I say we're going to live abundantly with a lower energy paradigm. It's going to change how we live, and I believe it's going to be better. Because now we're wacko. I mean, all the stuff we do, it's just crazy. And it's crazy because it's available. It's like, it's like in the United States, we are slow to catch on to the need for conservation and the need for recycling, etc. Well, there's a reason we're slow. It's because we live in a resource-rich uh, continent. I mean, we've had stuff that's been so wonderful for so many years, you don't think about it. You just don't think about it. It's, I liken it when I was traveling around the world, there were a couple of places that I lived that were so beautiful. 
I mean, it was so heavenly beautiful that I took it for granted. I didn't even look out there and say, my goodness, how lucky am I? Places, islands in, in the Aegean Sea, the Greek islands, or Bali, or New Zealand, or Samoa. I mean, they were just so wonderful, it took my breath away when I first got there, and then I just forgot about it. Well, it's the same way here. We've got resources, you know. You've heard the stories of people walking into our grocery stores from the Soviet Union and just just about losing it because there's so much produce of such a high quality that it was overwhelming. So we're going to go a different way. This is what John Lyle was suggesting. We take and we produce and we handle what's going on right where we are. And that is essentially one of the definitions of permaculture, and that is you take responsibility for your own needs right where you are to the maximum of your abilities. And it's, it's just being responsible as a human, and that takes consciousness, different than this. Here's probably, I say this every class, I say it again, this is probably the most important slide I'll show you the whole semester. <coughs> what it's talking about is thinking in terms of cyclical systems. And that is, you don't, there is no waste in nature. We, we're going to have to make a rap song or something about that so we can all start our class with that. You don't take stuff and throw it away. Every resource goes through a system, it changes. I mean, we take and we cut down a pine tree and we cut it up into boards and we make a house, okay? But then as we cut up that pine tree, what do we have? We have sawdust and we have some slag and stuff. What, we take that, what do we do with it? We put it someplace where we turn it into the resource base for the adjacent system. So this is what I said. My second goal for you in this course, my second objective, learn to think in terms of systems and designing systems. This is, is the symbol that tells you that. Everything is, uh, it's kind of reiterative. It kind of goes back and it, and it responds back to the, to the next source. Okay. And I love this. And this is kind of that epiphany I had when I watched that, that good planets are indeed hard to find. So <coughs> let's look at the ethics of permaculture quickly. Um, we will, I will ask for definitions as we go. And um, a definition, by the way, and typically I ask this, what's the definition of a definition? I'll tell you. A definition is the act of making clear. Um, or one of my all-time heroes, Webster, what he says is a word or a phrase expressing the essential nature, nature of a person or thing. That's, that is a definition. So what's a definition of ethics? And, and I've, uh, David Holmgren writes on this. He, he's, he's a great wordsmith as well, very well. Um, the moral principles that are used to guide actions toward good and right outcomes and away from bad and wrong outcomes. In other words, ethics kind of set where we have to go in order to maintain and elicit the greatest good for the greatest number all the time. There are other systems outside of, say, a set of ethics that we might hold to. And in our ethics, we, we make assumptions. But then we, we get outside of them and, and lose track of them in terms of how we think, for instance, about certain cultures. I mean, we're all, we all want the same thing. Every person on earth essentially is looking for the same thing. And different experiences have turned us and make us go in different ways, but we all basically want the same thing. The, the, the ethics act as constraints or survival instincts. Um, and basically what they're trying to do is set up a human behavior that's for the good of all society. So uh, they really, uh, they're a big deal. So the three ethics for permaculture 
are to care for the earth, um, care for the people, and then to share the surplus. You know, um, when we when we look really, um, and it's interesting when we <coughs> when we look at where the ethics come from and how they relate to other cultures. Um, many cultures in the past had an ethic that was more concerned with the welfare of the community. That was more the issue that they were taking on. And, um, and, and, and we take on an ethic in this country that is more concerned with the individual. Whether that's good or bad, that's just what is. That's where we are. And I think we're understanding, or we're beginning to understand, that really it's about, it's about thinking about not just the community, and I am going to encourage you to think in terms of your small neighborhood community. That's the unit that's going to be most important to you. But really now we're starting to think about a global community. And isn't that great? Because, you know, we're all in this together, so let's figure out a way to do that right. Um, I like the story of the Native Americans um, that have as an ethic, and, and I, I tell this story, uh, it may be chauvinistic, but I like it, and that is when the Native Americans, when uh, a male wanted to become a brave in this one particular tribe, and I'm a male, and I would like to be called a brave. I mean, doesn't that sound like a wonderful thing to be? I'm a brave. That says a lot about, you know. So I want to be a brave. Okay, this is what they had to do. They had to go out and make friends of a piece of land. So that doesn't sound like a typical macho male, does it? And, well, that's a brave. You're car what is a friend? What is a friend? Good and bad. You take, you take and you hold and stay with that person through good times and bad times. Then you're a friend. You're going to take a piece of land. You all have a special place on this earth, I know, at some point. And it changes as you go through your life. You know, I had a place called Peaceful Valley when I was a kid. We were schmaltzy and we named it Peaceful Valley because it was real special to us. And, and so that became my dear friend when I was a kid. And I used to, when, when I was troubled, you know, you know, as you go up into those middle school teenage years, you know, it all hits, hits the fan. Well, I went to Peaceful Valley. That was my friend in the place I took. I took solace. And so to be a brave, you had to care for a piece of land. And so it's a different ethic than what we're dealing with now. Because... You know, I hear these things. That's my land. Don't tell me what to do with it. You know, well, wait a minute. It's everyone's land, you know. So how can we apl apply that? If we look, for instance, at the first one, care for the earth. Um, you know the Gaia hypotheses? You all heard of that? John Lovelock? Basically what John Lovelock did, and there's a book simply called Gaia. Um, <coughs> And John Lovelock's an intriguing uh, human. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a scientist that studies air. And what happened, and the reason the Gaia hypothesis came about is there was a, a group of uh, heavy-duty scientists put together by the UN, and they said, let's go find life in the universe. And so they said, okay, how do we do that? And we'll put together these guys that know what's going on, and we'll shoot up some instruments or people in rocket ships, and John Lovelock said, well, you don't have to do that. So all you have to do is you take a picture of whatever planet you want to look at and, a, you know, picture. You know, scientists are taking it and they're breaking it down with all these electronic ways of looking at the different aspects. And he was going to look at the atmosphere. He said, I'll look at that and I'll tell you if there's life there. And they said, what are you talking about? He said, let me prove it. They shot a satellite up on the Earth, and they took a picture of the Earth. And he figured out how to look at the Earth using this to figure out if there was life here. And what he determined that not only was there life here, but he called the Earth sentient. What's that mean? Conscious. It's a living organism. Conscious, right. The better way to say it, that's, that's what it means. But the better way to say it is a sentient being is a being 
who can observe or take in the environment and act in a way to preserve its lifehood. So the earth acts in a way to protect itself. We have these very delicate balances of oxygen and nitrogen and all that stuff going on. You know, if we got a little more, what are we at in oxygen, 21%? If we got up to what, 23 or 4, we, would die. we spontaneously combust? Oh, yeah, right? well, that's a pretty small window. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> and so what the Earth does is it figures out how to do that. Okay, we got way too much oxygen or way too much CO2. How do we do that? Well, we'll get an algae bloom. That'll take away the CO2. Get a bigger algae, you know, and it goes on and on. In other words, the Earth makes changes to ensure its survival. So basically, if we look at that and think of the Earth as sentient, that's a hard one. That's a real hard one. I mean, I walk out and it's dirt and rocks. And yet, I know it's alive. I know it's alive. And I choose to believe it's alive, I guess is the thing. And maybe you all can try this. This is what, this is, I did this years ago. And, you know, I have to admit, I sometimes forget this, but I, I ask you to do this. You know, a lot of people will say, I'll believe it when I see it, right? You know, I, when I see that thing, then I'll believe it. If I see a ghost, I'll believe in ghosts, okay, or whatever. I took the opposite tack, and I took this a while ago, and I said, hmm, I'm going to believe it, and then I'm going to see what I see. Because that belief changes your perception. And so believe that the earth is alive and see how that impacts you this coming week. I want you to walk around on a sentient being and then tell me how that felt, okay? It changes. We have to change how we react. I really, truly believe that. Care for the people. At its base, and this is the second one, at its basic level, it means accepting personal responsibility for a situation as far as possible. How do I feed myself? How do I, how do I um, keep myself in shelter? How do I get around so that it, it works better for myself and everyone else? Wendell Berry, you all know Wendell Berry, that wonderful farmer and author and philosopher, Tennessee. He wrote this wonderful book called Leavings. And I'm not going to read you this poem because it's a little depressing. Um, but he talks about what are you willing to live with in terms of terrible impacts that your choices make in order to have your car running down the road or that amount of uh, food on your table or whatever. And it's in the book Leavings. It's, it's it, the, the poem, and he's read this on NPR. It's called Questionnaire. So go ahead and look that up on the web. I don't want to read it on the air, okay? But it's a good one. It's worth looking at. Um, the last one is Set uh, Limits to Consumption and reproduction, and redistribute the surplus. Now, certainly one of the things that happens, and I really like this, uh, I see this everywhere in this country, um, where folks are growing a garden and they have all this, oh man, what am I going to do with all this squash? Well, you're going to give it away. And that's what you do. <coughs> and what do you do with the tomatoes? Well, you're going to can some, you're going to eat some, and you're going to give it away. And everyone who's good at growing, and not everyone has to be good at growing. We don't all have to take on everything. We take on where our passion is, and we go from there to what we really want to do. And we share the surplus if we have it. One of the things that is surplus, especially at your age, is energy. <laughs> and please be willing to share that energy with folks my age, okay? <laughs> um, uh, because a lot of people just don't have it, and, and, and we, want, we want to take it and, and go with it. Um, part of it is understanding limits, you know, your limits. 
part of it is understanding the difference between needs and wants, obviously, you know. Um, but we'll go forward with that. Uh, I, I know it's a little preachy, I apologize. Um, but let's, let's look at where we're going. What do we got? 15 minutes, good. Um, I want to go over the principles fairly quickly here. Um, the, uh, and different people use different principles. And, uh, for instance, this is Bill Mollison's principle. This is in his book, Introduction to Permaculture, that you have a te as a text. Um, David Holmgren, you saw, wrote his book, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. He has 12 principles that he uses, and they're different slightly. There's a lot of overlap with some of what Mollison does. What I want to do, and, and these are the ones that, and I've kind of gone through a number of, of these giants before me, and then what makes sense to me. And these are the, the 11 that I use. And I'll go through them one by one, and we can look them over. By the way, one of the things we're trying to do, um, and certainly this is available to the distance, Ed, uh, but I want to make it available to you all as well. <laughs> we're going to figure out a way to post these PowerPoints to the website. So you'll have the ability to take them, download them, go over them again, and, and we will work on that. Okay. Um, observation is the number one principle for everything we do. We're going to look out at nature and we're going to figure out what's going on. So uh, it's a continuous observation using our senses to look at patterns. And patterns are a big deal. In, in how we take on what's going on in nature. You're looking at the pattern of weather, the pattern of wind, the pattern of how you get in and out of your house on a daily basis. The book that I use as a text in my design studio is Christopher Alexander's A Pattern Language. The Pattern Language book is the main text used by permaculture designers. And I was using it for 20 years before I learned that. So um, I, I feel real good about it. What we're trying to do is figure out what's the foundation of how nature is working around us and how we can best relate to those cycles. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, relative location. And basically, that's that one slide, the cyclical systems. Um, we're looking here at a, um, a couple of images from a gentleman that I once wrote an article for permaculture activist, uh, Joe Palacier. I visited him north of Auckland in New Zealand. And um, I think Joe Palacier was the best permaculturist I met in my around the world travels. And recall, I met David Holmgren and a bunch of other people. Uh, this guy was good. And that's, that's an image of him there. And what we're looking at here is um, Obviously, he's, he's got a centerpiece to it, and, and, and he's looking at a Zola here, which is usually looked on as, as Zola is kind of a, an algae that will grow on the, on the surface of the pond. He was growing a Zola to harvest, to use as a mulch. The thing I want you to look at is in the background where he's got this dove coat. And basically what he was doing, so he was making a place in the center of his garden for the doves to come in. And, and this is a zone one garden, and we'll look at zones in just a minute. But the thing that he did is understanding the way birds work. And if you're a gardener, you need to have this in your garden. I, I, I've discovered it by just letting it happen. Stick something in the ground to let the birds come in. What Joe did is he built this T. And the way birds come into a garden is they'll come in and they'll land and they'll check out the territory because they want to make sure there's no predators before they go in. Typically, they also make a nitrogen deposit so that they don't go back to their place and mess it up. So what Joe does is he takes this stick and where he needs fertilizer, he moves it around. So he's moving his fertilizer distribution around the garden. And it's, in other words, it's understanding all of the systems before you go any place with it. Okay, I hope this works. Arthur, can you help me? <laughs> there we go. 
So anyway, this is the system we're looking at, and this is how Joe is going about doing that, and, and I think it's a good way to go. Energy cycling, um, this is something, it, it took me a while to figure this out, and in fact, what you're looking at is a shower that I built the foundation for when I took my, my fundamentals permaculture course at the farm in Tennessee. And basically, and what it is is, and there's kind of a, a hyperbolic curve to the mirrored mylar, and it puts all the energy of the sun into that, um, that solar hot water heater. And so you can heat that up re three times as fast as just the sun hitting it. It's really great. And then what happens is underneath that, we put down a tarp, and we put gravel on that, so all the water coming out of the shower dropped on that tarp and went into the swale that we had going down it. And then as, this, as it went down the swale here, it went to another swale, and we, and we dug this swale absolutely level, threw the dirt up in a mound here, and then that became the place in the garden where they grew the plants, which is on the other side of that deer fence you see there. So <coughs> what we were doing is taking the water that came out of the well they had dug, using it as a shower, using it as irrigation for the garden, using it down at the bottom. You see this little re reflection here? That's a pond at the very end. The pond is where the beneficials the toads, the frogs, the dragonflies go to reproduce and, and come out. A, a, a mature toad will eat a pound of insects a week. Think how heavy an insect is. <laughs> now imagine how many it takes to make a pound. Um, yeah. And so you want toads in your garden. I think I did that. Ah, sorry. Can you help me again, Arthur? Thank you. Okay, each element performs many functions. This is typical design, we know this. Um, what I tell my students in my just normal uh, residential design course is, when you put in a place to store cars where you store them 95 to 98% of the time, design it as a patio. Design a patio for people that you just serendipitously store cars in 95% of the time. Okay, and also make it a basketball court. Okay, and all, so you're making multi-functions when you're doing it. It's the same thing here. Every element performs many functions. This is Charlie Headington's home in Greensboro. Hopefully we'll go visit it. And this is the south side of his house. Well, okay, he's got pear trees. Pear trees tend to grow more upright. And they're more compact. So in an urban context, a pear tree is a really good choice because it's tight and it does wonderful things. So he's got some pear trees. He's got, he, he built a bamboo trellis that he's growing lab labs and even some uh, grapevines on. And on, on this end, he's growing um, uh, kiwis. And what they do is they shade the house. They're, they're providing... Uh, relief from the intensity of the southern sun in the summer. They shade the house, they provide food, they provide habitat for wildlife, they provide beauty, so they're providing all of these functions all at the same time. Um, each function is supported, the, the corollary to that is each function is supported by many elements. So what are, the, what are the things you need? Do you need water? This is an image of the water catchment tank that I put in at my house a number of years ago. Um, we have, uh, we have and, and when we put it in, um, my wife got all excited. I got excited because we were capturing water that we could then irrigate with. She got excited because she wasn't worried about not having water because when Hurricane Fran came through 14 years ago, they wiped out the water. They wiped out everything. So, you know, we had to go to the grocery store to get gallons of water in order to drink. We didn't have it. This is extra water. We fill that up and then we irrigate, fill it up, irrigate. But if it's there, then we know we can heat it up and purify it and use it. We're not without water and we can use it. So we're looking, redundancy is a really big word. You'll want to big time go after that. I don't know if any of you do this now, but 
typically, you know, in this, in this setting, we don't have much snow, right? For those of you who are not from around here, we don't have much snow. We do have cold, wet weather, which means ice. And when we have ice and you get ice all over the power lines, they break. And so we have a lot of time when we're down without power. Okay, if your thermostat and, and your heating source and everything is dependent on electricity, what are you going to do? You need backup. And you figure out what that is. Do you have a wood-burning stove? Do you have gas logs in your fireplace? Uh, we don't, our place is really tiny. We don't have room for that. So we have one of those little um, uh, propane tank um, heaters. And I'll tell you, one time when my mother-in-law, who had Alzheimer's, was staying with us, and we were trapped in the living room for a week, that heater was a godsend. And I almost wanted the cold. I need to get out of here. It was something. I was running out of walls to climb. Okay. Um, efficient energy planning. And this has to do with human energy. And this is basically the icon that is, that is primarily associated with permaculture. And that is, it's like a target. It's, it's, a, it's a bullseye. And what it talks about is where you spend most of your time, that's where you put the things that take most of, that take time to manage. So it's broken down into zones. Zone zero is the house, the school, the office, whatever. Um, zone one, it's the most intensively managed. And you put garden, workshop, clothesline, et cetera there. Zone, zone two, still managed fairly intensely, but slightly away. Um, uh, ponds, I put chickens between one and two. Chickens go between one and two because you've got to go to the chickens twice a day if you, if you um, manage them the way I do, and yet you don't want them too close. <laughs> one in the morning because um, they wake up early. And uh, in Raleigh, we can't have roosters, and what happens is usually one of the hens takes over that role of crowing. Um, and sometimes, sometimes there's some aroma associated with them. Um, number three, <coughs> water uh, typically only available selectively, uh, large animals, uh, nut trees, etc. Um, components that you don't have to spend a lot of time with. Semi-managed, you just typically go to harvest. I think of this as a bamboo grove or if I go, when I grew up we had down behind our home, we had a wood lot, <coughs> and if we needed something for whatever, we just go down to the wood lot. It was at one time structures. That's where you went. You took the dead wood to put in your stove if you needed it, put in your furnace if you needed it to heat the house. Um, number five, and this is where I'm struggling in my piece of land. I don't have a good number five. Number five, zone five, is a place where you don't do anything. You leave it. You leave it and you go there to learn. That's the place that is the most natural and the most self-sufficient. And I struggle with that because our place is so small that most of it is managed in some way. And I like to leave a part of it. And, and part of the reason for that, <coughs> and I won't spend as much time talking about this as I did last semester, um, I believe in fairies. I like to think there are other entities of other consciousness running around in the world doing wonderful things to plants and flowers. I just, that makes my life richer. And so I believe in that and I want to give them a place to live. So I, it, this, is, this is my challenge for my place. And if I give them that place, it will be better. In fact, um, uh, again, the magic of Findhorn, if you want to look into that. Um, this is the example of that that I had when my wife and I were first getting together. Um, we were renting a place, uh, it, part of one portion of a house, <coughs> and we had this postage stamp lamp a lot out front. And where she is kind of digging and putting in a garden, this was about three-quarters of a mile from campus. And so 
and we walked to campus every day. So each one of us walked by it twice a day. So we had the most productive garden. If you look at the, at the place up on the um, uh, right, oh, go back. I can't touch it. Okay. The place on the right was the place that we, say what? Do it now? Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'll go quick. We'll be done soon, folks. Uh, the place on the, the upper right was uh, where our production garden was. We walked by it twice a day. And so both of us were looking at it, managing it. It wasn't, it wasn't any bigger than this. And we had almost more production off that than in, in most of the gardens we've had since. Because, one, I double dug it. It had a lot of that really nice clay there. Clay is a good soil to grow in because it's got all of those cations for exchange if you get it mixed up and going well. And because we were looking at it all the time, it became our zone zero garden. And therefore, by managing it and being on top of it, it really worked. Number seven, small-scale intensive systems. Actually, they're more efficient. The most efficient size garden for the best production are between a quarter and one acre. And for the longest time, the USDA was saying, get bigger, get out. We have 2,000 acre farms, one person running it, you know, and you can imagine the size of the tractor to do that. So th at the smaller systems, you have to be more in tune, in touch with it. So they're actually more efficient when you get going with it. Use edges and value the marginal. I like this from Mollison's book, that little image on the left where if you plant in straight rows, you get 36 plants, and if you plant in wavy rows, you get 45. Um, Corps of Engineers figured this out down in Florida. They straightened it out so they could run the water through quicker. And what happens was they got flooding because if you've got a meandering course river, obviously it's going to carry more water. One of the biggest projects in this country ever is taking that straightened out channel down in the Everglades and turning it back into a wandering, meandering stream. Accelerating succession and evolution. And this is really a good one. And part of what we'll do, in every system, there's a sequence of plants or elements that work. And the top left is essentially... It, it's from the tall grass prairie out west when I visited, but just imagine a devastated landscape. It's bare. Now what happens? Seeds come in, those pioneer seeds that start to cover it and start to grow stuff. Eventually, it'll get to a climax forest, like the one in the lower left you see there. In every particular setup all along the way in succession, there are plants that work. And what we as permaculture designers are going to do is we're going to pick and choose and we're going to figure out which ones we take from which system based on our needs. And, and what you see in the right-hand image is Robert Hart's garden. Robert Hart wrote the book Forest Gardening. And basically he looked at how the aboriginal cultures had through the ages put their gardens together. And I've seen some of those in my travels around the world. And a lot of the English, when they were going around the world and colonizing everything, they'd go to these gardens, which were incredibly productive, and just devastate them, tear them out, because they said they don't have a garden, they don't have anything going on here. Well, they did. They were self-supporting gardens, and they weren't in neat rows. Um, and basically what they do is they put in all these trees, and, and Mollison talks about it. You'll see it in the video, and, and you'll read about it in some of the books. Um, and, and the fruit trees, I think of fruit trees as being good for about 10 to 15 years. And then you take them out, and when you take them out, there's sun, and you put in sun-needing plants, your annuals, and then you put back your fruit trees, and they'll take a few years to come back in, and then you move over to the next fruit tree. That's the way the aboriginal cultures were doing it. Use and value diversity. These are some of Bill Mollison's quotes. I love them. Tidiness separates species and creates work. Um, and may also invite pests, where, where order integrates. And so we're looking at, on the left-hand side, this is Harvey Harmon, a wonderful gardener out in Bear Creek, south of Pittsburgh. And what he's got is he's got some um, cucumbers grown in cages. And on the front of them, he's got basil to the right because basil needs hot sun. 
And to the left of it, he's growing summer celery here in North Carolina. Summer celery, it's too hot here to grow it. I don't know if you've got any going, Haley. I've never even tried it. I don't even want to try it. It's so, it's so tough to grow. Harvey was putting it in the shade side of his cucumbers and therefore making it work. So you're, you're in effect putting together gills, if you will. And so, and, and Mollison talks a lot about gills. I get a lot of people doing projects on gills, plant gills. Um, Mollison is from the tr tropics or the subtropics, and gills work there like crazy. Um, Harvey is of the opinion, and I, I take this from him, he's an excellent teacher, that <coughs> what we need to deal with in the temperate regions are plant animal gills. And I've, I've kind of copied Harvey, I've got my peach trees in my chicken coop, because there's, there's a peach borer that grows in the ground, comes up, and goes into the tree. The chickens love the peach borer. I don't have problems with peach borer down in my, in my chicken coop. Um, I, I illustrate this with, again, shots from the a tall grass prairie. The upper right is a look at the grasses, and they've, they've put buffalo back on that land. It's a big, huge park, and they put about 3,000 buffalo back. And, you know, I tried to take the lower right-hand photo capturing the buffalo making a deposit <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't quite get it, but there's always Photoshop. <laughs> um, and the last one, use biological resources, and really this is a key. Obviously, lower left, we see <coughs> some sort of a purple martin house with a really good um, uh, permaculturist up in the mountains. The right, uh, the guy in the blue jacket is Graham Alexander. He wrote the book, The Permaculture Garden. Some of you may want to take that on. And basically, that's a chicken tractor that you move along the rows in the garden, and it takes out the insects, takes out the pests, takes out the weed seeds, makes the nitrogen deposit. It all works in a system. Upper right uh, is uh, a chicken named Donna King because of the crazy hairdo who used to live under the outdoor dining terraces at Earth Haven, picking up drop food so that the... the um, Ants did not move in. So um, you're using what you have. Now, uh, a couple last slides. This is uh, David Holmgren's look. I know it's kind of a difficult thing to see. He sees it as the permaculture flower, and he's got seven different ones, uh, land and nature stewardship, built environment, tools and technology, culture and education, health and spiritual well-being, finances and economics, land tenure and community governance, we will deal with the five that fit within the physical systems primarily here. The physical systems we all need to survive. We're not going to do all of them. I want you to get going. I'm not going to make you a permaculture designer here. I want to introduce the vocabulary, get you excited, get you moving forward, and you'll take them all on. And these are the five physical systems that I'm going to run through with you. And uh, last, I'm going to end with this. Um, and it, it really is part of what they say. If you're going to save the world, start at your doorstep. So one of the things, one of the assignments I want each of you to do, and, and we're not going to do it now, I want you to make some container somehow. I don't know what it is. And it's either just outside or just inside. And I want you to grow something and grow something, and I'd rather have it something you can eat. It could be an herb, it could be, um, it could be a green. So, I, I mean, some of you are gardeners and you're doing it. And what I'm going to want you to do is to, is to document that with images, and we'll put it on the web. I will get that assignment up and I will put it on the web for you. I want you to do that this semester. You can, you know, I thought in my studio of growing, you know, those upside down tomatoes? <laughs> oh man, they intrigue me. Um, I, you know, I don't know how to water them, but I wanted to put that in the studio so we could have uh, salads every time. So basically, you look at this, and it's probably hard to see here, but again, this is my backyard. This is the photo on the cover of Gaia's Garden. This can be paradise. And I've been to what I would consider paradise. I've been to Samoa. I've been to Bali. But right now what I'm trying to do is make this paradise for me. And we can do that. And we can have abundance. I guarantee it. I'm over.
but I tend to do that. I just have to warn you. So uh, get, get used to this time. Thanks, folks. I'll see you next week.